Okay, let us begin this uh, Herculean task of condensing 40 lectures in 4 lectures. So naturally when I try to do such a thing, uh, one has to sort of be very selective on what you want to do. Uh, what uh, I have decided to uh, select is partly based on what we found uh, that the students find it very difficult to. Uh, so what uh, my plan is the following that uh, in the next four lectures that I am giving you, we will be uh, doing the following. Uh, one of the things which I think you should make uh, the students very clear, what is actually meant by a field? We keep on talking about uh, electric field, magnetic field, gravitational field. So what is a field? Uh, what we have found is this, that unless you make this clear, the students just think that field is just another vector. So I would spend a bit of a time in pointing out what is a field. Um, in particular, because we'll be talking about electric and the magnetic field, uh, I'll be talking about vector field and its mathematical representation. Then I will try to do even a much bigger task. See the electricity magnetism course, which uh, we give or you will be, you are giving uh, that requires a uh, good understanding of vector calculus. Now what you will find is that you expect the mathematics teachers to do this job for you and uh, most of the time you will find that they are more interested in uh, if limit, limit epsilon goes to zero what happens to delta or things like that and physics people they don't, couldn't care less about what happens to epsilon and delta. They assume that if something is to be differentiated, it will be differentiated, okay, or it is differentiable. We don't really prove any existence and things like that. So the point is this, that vector calculus, I have written, I'll give you a crash course on vector calculus in half an hour. As you can see that uh, normally a vector calculus course itself is a one semester course. Um, having done that, I will be in this lecture, I'll be talking about electric field and potential, electric flux and Gauss's law. We'll be spending some time in discussing properties of conductors and dielectrics. The, uh, you must have realized while teaching this course, if you have taught it, that uh, uh, most of the electricity magnetism course essentially 50% of the time goes in teaching electrostatics. And the reason is that uh, the magnetic phenomena, the magnetostatics problem, there is no greatly, great deal of new mathematics that comes in. Some things does come, for example, the concept of a vector potential, which is uh, never clear to the students. So I keep on telling you not what is not clear to you, but I'm going to talk about what is not clear to the students. So even if I am repeating something that you know, uh, I'm simply giving you my um, experience of what students find difficult to assimilate. So vector potential is one such concept. And that I will be spending a bit of time on. The, uh, after that, after the electrostatics and the magnetostatics, I'll be discussing the time uh, dependent phenomena uh, and then depending upon how much of time I am left with in these four lectures we will be trying to talk about electromagnetic waves. So let us, uh, let us proceed with that. Well this is roughly what I told you that uh, my second part will have magnetic field. Um, charged particle in a magnetic field has fantastic or tremendous uh, applications for engineers. Uh, in fact, uh, you must have all learned because you are all physics people that we talk about uh, LHC, the particle accelerators and things like that. And uh, so the knowing the principle of accelerators, how they are applied, it requires the behavior of charged particle in a magnetic field. Then I'll be talking about uh, force on current carrying conductors, potential energy of magnetic dipoles, amperes and bias of Hertz law and et cetera, et cetera. It's nothing so special about it. So please uh, uh, 
We, as, as uh, Professor Fatak pointed out, we are all teachers, so I am not here to teach you, but I am essentially giving you a review of electrodynamics, and if you have a question pertinent to whatever I am talking about, simply raise your hand, and uh, then I will take the question, and the, when you ask a question, it will be nice if uh, you also identify yourself, so that your colleagues can know what it is. Okay, so let us come to this question of what is the field. I am assuming we all know what are vectors and scalars. As you know that vectors are essentially quantities which have, the, as we learned in our school, which have both magnitude and direction. Now field could be a scalar or a vector. And uh, so the difference between a field and a, let us say, scalar field and a scalar uh, quantity is that the field is defined at every point in space in a, in a particular region of space. For instance, if I take this room as a region of space of my interest, then at every point in this room, I define several fields. For instance, I can define a temperature field. I can define a gravitational field. Now it's a different matter that the gravitational, the acceleration due to gravity g, it doesn't vary very much from one point to, point to another. But if you recall the definition of the acceleration due to gravity, then you will realize there is no reason why the acceleration to gravity is the same here or it is there. Temperature is a scalar quantity. There is no particular reason why the temperature should be this, uh, have one particular value at this point and another, uh, you know, the same value at this point, which it doesn't have. So for example, now the thing becomes uh, uh, apparent. If you are looking at, for example, your kitchen at your home, now you can find the temperature gradient. If you are close to your um, cooking stove, then the temperature there is more. You go towards the window, the temperature decreases. So in other words, the room, for instance, in this example, kitchen, uh, at every point there, there is a scalar quantity defined, which I decided to call it as temperature field. Likewise, the quantity that I'm discussing could be a vector. So for example, the gravitational field, which in principle has different values at different points, though since the differences are so small, I might decide that they're roughly the same. And that's why you, are to, you tell your students that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meter per second square. It's not that it has exactly the same value everywhere. So in talking about a vector field, we associate in addition to a magnitude, a direction at every point in space. So gravitational field, electric field, magnetic field, or even if you are looking at the uh, motion of liquid in a place, then even your uh, flow field of a liquid or a fluid, it is an example of a vector field. So what I'm going to do is this. So uh, there's something written here on red. It's not very important if they cannot switch off the lights. Uh, so because the numbers are not particularly important. So I'm trying to tell you how to sketch a field. And this is something which you can ask your students to do. Uh, what I've done is I've just said that consider a mathematical field vector field in two dimension, which is given by y i minus 2 x j. It is a good exercise. You ask your students that take a computer and plot it. It's a two dimensional plot. So you look at what I have done here, which is not visible properly, is I have given you that the, uh, oh good, at least something is visible now. You can see at this point, which says, at the point 0, 1, this is, if this is 0 and y is 1, the vector is i. Similarly here, minus 2, 0, 
So if x is minus 2, that becomes minus minus plus 4, 4j and minus 2i. So this is what is written here. So one can take a graph paper and what you do is you um, plot the vectors by taking some sort of units that look x axis uh, one unit of length will be this much, y axis one unit of length will be this much and based on that we will uh, plot this function. So let us do that. So look at uh, this, this is uh, a very rough plot. So what I have done here is I have taken a, uh, say for example if it is just i, so I have taken one i, this would be two i, this will be whatever and uh, so you, you plot an ordinary vector and you start getting the uh, way a vector field looks like. But uh, your students are likely to be more tech savvy than you and me. So what uh, they, you would like to do is to tell them that look, um, you don't have to go by a pencil and a paper, uh, but you for example this I have uh, drawn in Mathematica software and uh, you have a vector field plotting facilities in that and maybe you can ask somebody, uh, students they do either Mathematica or Maple or uh, whatever, whatever they use. And see the idea is that they can get a visual impression of what a vector field looks like actually. Okay? And this is of great importance when you try to teach them, for example, curl of a vector field, the gradient of a vector field and things like that. So what I am going to do now is this, I told you that I am going to give you a quick uh, course, crash course on vector calculus. Uh, there are a few things I need. And that is few things that you will be needing if you are teaching electrodynamics. Uh, we need definitions of line integral, surface integral, volume integrals are nothing interesting. We also need the concept of uh, gradient, divergence and curl and couple of theorems, namely the divergence theorem and the Stokes theorem. I think if you spend enough time in teaching your students this much of mathematics, so far as your electrodynamics course is concerned, I think you will find that uh, they should not have, because this is something which we repeat even though they have done a calculus. So we said that a vector field is defined at every point in space. Go back to your idea of how did you define differentiation and integration. Remember that when we define integration of a single variable or differentiation of a single variable, for instance if you are talking about differentiation, we told our students that look or we were told by our teachers that take the value of the function at point x, subtract from it the value of the function at the point x minus h, divide it by h, let h become very small and the quantity that you get is called the differential of the function f. So this is the way we define it. Now the difference is and how did we define integration? We said that all right, split the region into a fine mess and find out what is the value of that function at every point in that mesh. Imagine that the mess is small enough so that the value of the function may be treated as constant in that region, sum it up, right? Integration was defined as a limit of sum and based on that you explain to the, your students what is actually integration. Now I do exactly the same. So what we do is we say that all right, the difference is my vector field not only has a magnitude but also has a direction. So when I choose my section, when I, I have a line which I choose its, I, I split it into various small sections, I must make it so small that over every such infinitesimal section 
not only the magnitude of the function, but the direction of the function also remains the same. And uh, so therefore, if you have an arbitrary curve, the direction of the field there is simply along the tangent to that curve. And what I do is I take the direction of the force field, dot it with the uh, tangent to the curve at that point and say that sum it up. Now this is then my definition of the line integral of a vector field. So this is, this is what I was trying to tell you that take an arbitrary curve, I am, I am plotting over this and uh, at every point I make it so small that supposing the field direction is this and the direction of the DL is along the tangent to the curve and this is just a normal field plotted and this is what you do and you define the line integral that way. The second thing that I need very badly is what is known as a surface integral. The picture that I have given you is that of a fluid flow. V stands for the velocity direction there. Now you see the point is this, that if you have a fluid which is flowing along that direction and if in the fluid I put a, an area which is this. Now let us suppose the normal to that area is along the direction of the fluid flow. Now that would be the situation where the maximum amount of fluid would pass through this surface. On the other hand, if you were to incline it, if you were to incline it, then the amount of fluid that will pass in is related to the projection of this surface which whose normal is along this along the velocity direction. One of the things that you have to convince your students that if I consider a surface, it is not a vector. A surface is not a vector, but suppose I take, make the surface very small, make it a surface element. Now if I make it a surface element, it can be considered as flat enough. Now if I have an actual optically flat surface, like reasonably shown, for example, this blackboard data set, then I can look at surface as a vector. Now how is surface as a vector? Go back to definition of what is a vector. School definition of a vector. School definition of a vector is it is a quantity which has a magnitude and a direction. The only thing that I change now is to say that it is a quantity which has a magnitude and a unique direction can be associated with it. Now, so if I have a surface, let us take the, well this is not, this is a surface. So I define or associate a direction with this surface which is perpendicular to it. Now notice that is the reason I wanted it to be as small as possible because if it is a surface like this, then the direction of the perpendicular at this point is not the same as the direction of the perpendicular at that point. But on the other hand, if I have optically flat surface, the, and it is very small, the directions are the same. Now, so therefore, if I have a surface element, a unique direction can be associated with it. And since my traditional definition of a vector is a quantity which has a magnitude, in this case some millimeter square and a unique direction, then I also call that surface element as a vector. So with this, the, I define the flux which is the same as the surface integral of this vector field over this surface. So F, the entire surface I split into small surfaces and ds is the direction of each surface element. So 
surface element can be regarded as a vector and this defines the concept of a surface uh, integral. Now notice one thing, here there is a, is a picture there of a some sort of a, let us take something like a hemispherical cup. It has been badly drawn, but that is not important. Now, you notice one thing that I have a surface here, but, but this is an open system so that this surface has a boundary which is a curve. Now, on this surface, the direction of the normal at every point is the outward normal that is take a small area and go ahead. There are some points that you should make it clear to the students. Not every surface has a surface integral. This surface, the picture that I am showing you, okay, this is a Fisherman's net. Now, it has a surface area, you can see it. It has a well-defined inside surface and a well-defined outside surface. So, you take a piece of paper, it has a one surface which is above you and surface which is below. Now, suppose you want to go from this surf of a piece of paper from above the surface to below it. For instance, take this net, supposing in this net, I want to move from the top of the net to under, under the rim. There is no way I can do that without crossing a boundary. The same with your piece of paper. You are writing something, supposing now you want to go to the underside of that paper, then you have to cross the edge of that paper. This is the property of a true surface. That is, in order to move from one surface to another, to the other side, you need to move through. But there are surfaces which have only one side. I could have actually, if someone gives me a piece of paper, I can even show you. Yes, he is giving it. Just tear it off. See, you can actually, so this is two surface, two sided surface. This side, that side, if I want to go from here to there, I have to cross the edge. But let us look at slightly different situation. You can actually make it if you just had a, have a cello tape with you. So I take this, now what I do is I fold it and instead of joining like this, I join it like that, put a, put a cellotel there. This is what I have drawn here. You see that was a ribbon and what I have done is that while putting a cellotel there, instead of doing it like this, I have done it like that. Now you see the point is this, this, has, this is a surface but I can go from any point to any point on this, right? Supposing I want, I am on the top side, I want to come to the bottom side, I am not crossing any edge at all. I can continuously come through it. These are called one-sided surfaces. A typical example is what is given here, it is called a Mobius strip. The theorems that we talk about, they are not applicable for one-sided surfaces. They are only applicable for proper true surfaces. So that was about summation. I am already as you can see running short of time because I said half an hour course but that is always difficult. Let us come back to scalar field. Let us come back to differentiation. So summation or integration of scalar you know, integration of vector field I told you. Let us look at differentiation. Now, in order to do that, recall what is meant by an ordinary derivative. I just now told you that supposing I have a function fx, what is df by dx? We know that df by dx essentially gives you the slope of the curve. So, if you take x going to x plus delta x, then f of x plus delta x is given by this quantity. But this is one dimension much easier and that is the reason why we teach them in school. The question is that when you are in more than one dimension, 
how do you define a derivative? So in more than one dimension, your concept of derivative is also dependent on in which direction you are changing. For example, I said, let x go to x plus delta x. Now supposing I want to go from, let us say this point. So this is, this is a picture in, uh, this blackboard is two dimension. Now suppose I want to find out what is the value of the derivative of some function at this point. Now the question is that had it been in one dimension, I would have said, all right, this is x go to x plus delta x. But now I can go from that point to a nearby point in any direction around 360 degrees. And this concept is what is known as a directional derivative. In, at every point, there is a derivative, but you can define it in any particular direction that you want. And uh, so let us suppose I am talking about derivative here, but going in this way. So I go to a specific direction, delta s from the point to x plus delta x, y plus delta y, z plus delta z. So the directional derivative of the function phi along this direction, delta s, is given by the standard formula that is d phi by dx. This is something which your students would have done that this is partial f with respect to x dx by ds. And since phi depends upon x, y, z, you take all the three. Just to give you a small exercise, you say find the directional derivative of this point at the point 1, 1, 2. I have given the directional derivative of, let's say i plus 2j. That's the field that I plotted in the beginning. Don't worry about that. I'll come back to that point. So what do I do? I say, all right, this is a two-dimensional picture. So I want df by ds. So write down your function was given. Find out what is the partial of the function with respect to x, which is 2x. And, and so this is your df by dx definition. So along i plus 2j, notice y is 2x and dy by dx is 2. And this you can very trivially calculate. So this is the concept of a directional derivative. So let me define the gradient. The mathematical definition you all know. But what I'm going to be talking about is this, that what is the relationship of the gradient? Why is gradient so-called? You remember that when I talked about directional derivative, I had a partial derivative dotted with df by dx. So in other words, if you defined u, unit vector u, along the x, y, and z direction, then your directional derivative in that direction is given by gradient of phi. Gradient of phi, as you know, is defined as i d phi by dx plus j d phi by dy plus k d phi by dz. And that is given by the magnitude of the gradient times the angle between the gradient and the unit vector along that direction, which is grad phi cos theta. So if you look at that, you find that the magnitude of the gradient is the maximum magnitude of the directional derivative. So the maximum ma magnitude of the directional derivative happens when cos theta is equal to 1. And the direction of the gradient is along the direction in which the directional derivative is maximum. So just to explain to you what it actually means, let me show you this picture. See, supposing I am at this point. This is a hill. I mean, you will find lots of hills around IIT. Now, I am at hill. Supposing you want to come from this point to that point. Now, there are many ways of coming from this point to that point. One of the possibilities is you just decide, go like this, or come like that. But there is a direction in which the descent is steepest. 
So it is that direction which is the direction of the gradient. So gradient direction, as I told you, is the direction in which the directional derivative has maximum value. So in this picture, your this is the direction of the gradient. Then what is the direction of the gradient? You all know what is meant by a level curve. The level curve, if you have forgotten, is the curve along which a function has a constant value. And since we are talking about the direction in which its change is maximum, so the magnitude of the gradient is directed along the normal to this level curve. Now, why am I talking about that? We are going to be talking about electrostatic field. In electrostatic field, you find it's convenient to discuss things in terms of potential. Now, the point is this. Now, take, for example, a curve like a uh, function of x, y, which is x square plus y square. You know that level surfaces are circles because x square plus y square equal to constant is equation to a circle. Now, look at what is its gradient. Calculate the gradient, which is partial x square by x, which is 2x i plus 2yj, which is nothing but vector 2r. This is in the radial direction because it's along vector r and is normal to the level curve. As you already know, that if I have an equipotential surface, what is an equipotential? The surface or the curve along which the potential is constant. So equipotential surfaces are level curves of mathematics. And the gradient is the direction of the electric field. Why? Because you want to go from one level curve to another. The steepest would be if you go perpendicular to that direction. So this is uh, the idea that you find out where the potential remains constant and you know the gradient of the potential is the direction of the electric field. Having done that, let me go to the next one. There is another property of vector field, namely the divergence of a vector field. Now divergence is formally defined by this relation. I, I will show you a picture of the vector field. See, as the name suggests, the divergence tells you how much does a vector field spread out. I told you how to draw the pictures. I will come back to the pictures. So it is possible that a vector field, supposing I am looking at this point and I am looking at another point, it spreads out like this. On the other hand, it might remain much closer, in which case the divergence is smaller. And that is the, most of the names are names with common sense. Now, so therefore we define the divergence of a vector field. I take a small volume element and you know that associated with every volume is a small surface. I calculate how much is the surface integral of that divided by the volume and will take the volume go to zero. This is the formal definition of a divergence. Now look at what's happening. See, here I have given, supposing this is my whole system, the big one, this plus this. So there is a surface here, the bottom surface, there is a surface at the top. Now suppose this volume I am to split. So look at, I've done the same thing here, that I have now split this and that. So you notice now that at the place where I sliced them, the, remember the direction of a surface is always along the outward normal. That's convention. So what I say is this, that where you split, there was no surface, 
Now a pair of surface was created, one with its outward normal like this, and another surface with its outward normal like that. And since the magnitude of both these surfaces which you cut must be the same, it tells you that when you add them up, I still am left with only the outside ones. Look at what is this divergence like. So the question as I told you is how much does a vector field spread out? Look at this picture. This is a picture of a vector field plotted in Mathematica. Now look at this. That Now how do you find out? You take certain region. Remember the best picture of divergence is to think of a liquid flow. Now supposing I consider a some area here. You notice that if I take an area here, the vectors which are going out seem to be much bigger than the vectors which are coming in. I, I take a small circle here, which means more liquid is going out than coming in. As to whether that is a permitted in liquid theory or not, that's unimportant. Okay? But this tells you my divergence is positive. My divergence is positive. Okay? On the other hand, here you look at it. Here what happens is, if you take again a circle, you see much bigger vectors are coming in and smaller things are going out. This is an example of a negative velocity, uh, negative divergence situation. On the other hand, I hope I have that picture. So I don't have it, it doesn't matter. You could have situations where the amount of liquid that is going in is equal to the amount of liquid that is coming, going, coming out. The vectors have the same magnitudes coming in, going out. They are the usual zero divergence situation. So look at this, the same picture now. So what we do is this, that I take a volume and I say that, look, how much of fluid is flowing through this space? I'm going to accelerate a little bit because I've already taken half of my time. And then I say that, all right, supposing rho is the density. And Let's, let's call this, uh, this, is, this is the way we have drawn, done it, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. And you can sort of see that this area is along the x-z direction. So therefore, the mass of the fluid flowing at this phase, you notice this, that this is going into the thing and direction is minus y. This is the positive y, this is, the, both of them are positive y. Here, the uh, fluid is going in here it is coming out, so therefore, the net increase in the volume, mass of the fluid is given by this. So, now this is something which is really not directly connected with us immediately, and I can add up from six phases, and I find out from six phases, my total increase in mass is given by this, which if you recall, is the definition of del dot, that is divergence of V times this, okay? Now, since the volume is fixed, rate of increase of mass can only happen if there is a change in the density. So therefore, I get by equating this to d rho by dt times dx dy dz, what is known as continuity equation, which is true in uh, fluid flow and later on when we talk about current. So this is a picture which I was talking to you about. You can see it here that this has been drawn on Mathematica. The, uh, this is a field which is x square y i plus x y square j. Divergence you can immediately calculate is 4 x y. If it is 4 x y, if x and y are positive, that is in, you are in this quadrant, then you can see my divergence is positive. Now how do I know divergence is positive? You can see much bigger arrows are going out. On the other hand, if I go to a fourth quadrant or a second quadrant where x and y have opposite sign, I will have the divergence to be negative, which is again shown by bigger arrows going in, smaller arrows coming out. And as I was looking here, this is the field which is xi minus yj, divergence of f is equal to zero, this is the field. You might like it to ask your students, particularly because if you do that, they have a much better appreciation of what divergence, uh, well, I, my next picture will be on curl. Now remember I um, talked about 
the divergence definition was this. So therefore, if you write down what is f dot n ds, you can simply write it as divergence of f dv. Now, if you take the limit and do the sum, what you find is what is known as divergence theorem. There is a very important theorem, I mean, which simply says, if you take divergence of a vector and take a volume integral thereof, what you get is the surface integral of that vector itself. Now, you know, sometimes the students sort of say, sir, are we supposed to memorize it? You know, he might suddenly say f dot n d tau equal to dive v ds. This is routine. But then you could sort of tell them that look at there is a simple way of knowing whether ds should come here or there. And the reason is this, that when you take a divergence, you are essentially doing a differentiation. Right, i d by d x, etc. Right, or d d by d x of that. Now, when you do a differentiation, your length magnitude or length uh, scale reduces by one. D f by d x, since you are dividing it by a distance. So, therefore, divergence of f, okay, multiplied with d tau. Here, one length scale was reduced because you have taken divergence and you have got a tau which is the volume. So therefore, the, mag the, the uh, dimension of this side is dimension of a surface. So this is an important theorem. And likewise, I now go to talk about what is known as a curl. Now, the definition of the curl, the word came from circulation of a vector, is very similar to what I gave as the definition of a divergence. Remember in the divergence, I said integral f dot ds divided by volume. Now I say, similarly, define a line integral divided by a surface. And this quantity, okay, the See, in the other case, I had a volume integral with a dot. So it is, uh, and, and now with the curl, I associate a direction n. Now you can see what is happening here. The same type of thing, that if you have a surface, go, divide it into many. The curls are given like this. So if you look at an area in between, you find one of the circulations is going in the clockwise direction, the other one is going in the anticlockwise direction. So therefore, there is again no contribution from the inside. The only thing that I am left with will be the outside things. So the line integral of the vector is the surface integral of the curl of the vector. Again, the dimensional question comes up. Curl is a differentiation. So therefore, the dimension reduces by one length. So therefore, if I am multiplying with a area, so the net I have is f times a length area. So this is all the basic mathematics that I wanted to do. This is nothing you are all familiar with the expression for the curl. So let me give you a physical reason for what is a curl. See, the name curl came from, again, fluid dynamics. See, the entire vector calculus, the people had worked out when they used to do fluid dynamics. Now, notice what we are trying to say is this, that consider a pedal wheel inside a liquid. Now, the point is that supposing you have a pedal wheel like this, under what condition will this wheel rotate? So here, I have given a uh, profile of the liquid velocities. You can see that this is the x direction. So in this, my dvy by dx is greater than 0. On the other hand, 
this is the y direction. So dv, vy is increasing with x. On the other hand here, I, my velocities are in the x direction and my vx magnitude is decreasing with y because it's in the negative direction. Now only you can now see by common sense, only if such a thing takes place that there in proper sense, then only this wheel will rotate. Now this is the picturization of a vector field which has a constant curl in the z direction. So if you ask your students that try to work these out using Mathematica, Maple or uh, whatever they use, you will find that their experience of dealing with vector fields become much better. Okay, couple of languages. So. When you express a vector field, remember curl is a vector. So divergence of a vector field is a scalar field. Curl of a vector field is a vector field. Since curl itself is a vector, supposing I have a field f, which I use it to express it as a curl of another vector field. So if f is equal to del cross a, then you can immediately show that the divergence of f is equal to 0 because divergence of a curl is always equal to 0. This is trivial. The arithmetic, you can work it out. Such a field is known as a solenoidal field, a divergenceless field. So you can either call it divergenceless field or say that field is expressible as a curl of a. In electromagnetic theory, which is the field which is a solenoidal field? Anybody? Sorry? The magnetic field. The ma why is magnetic field solenoidal? Yeah? It's just a mere of spectrum. Yeah, but that is simply restating my question. But why did it, does it happen? Because? Magnetic field is not everything. No. And the answers are coming in. So, the if you have seen the lines of forces due to an electric charge, for example, it's a positive charge, you see that the lines of forces are all diverging from there. Negative charge they're coming in. You don't have a corresponding situation in magnetism. You take a magnet which has a north-south pole, cut it, you again get north-south pole. In other words, it has not been possible. Incidentally, I must also tell you, there is no theory which says magnetic monopoles do not exist. In practice, nobody has been able to isolate a magnetic monopole. Experimentally, magnetic monopoles have never been found. Theoretically, there is no reason why they should not exist. But since we deal with practice, magnetic monopoles don't exist. And this comes up as that the magnetic field is a solenoidal field. Its divergence is 0. Divergence of B is equal to 0 is one of the Maxwell's equations that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Sit down and shout. Sir, you said uh, theoretically it's not possible. Yes. Yeah. Sir, you said theoretically it uh, still not there that magnetic monopole cannot exist. Yeah. But what about Maxwell's second equation? It says del dot b is equal to zero. That means there is no source for. No, no, no. So the point is this: that if you recall, I will be coming to that equation. His his asking. Maybe you should always say who you are. Sir, I am Dr. Samrajit from Assam. Okay, good. Um, so he is asking that if magnetic monopoles, there is no theoretical reason why they don't exist, how do you explain divergence of B equal to 0? The point I am trying to make is, if magnetic monopoles were to be discovered tomorrow, then your divergence B equation will change. Not only that, something else will also change. Which other equation will change? See, remember, we are calling these laws, right? What are laws? 
Laws are things which on which your entire edifice of physics is based. You don't try to explain law as to why it happens. The matter of fact is magnetic monopoles don't exist. As a result, we find that the divergence of B is equal to 0. Where did it come from? Experimentally, it was found that the Coulomb's law is the basic for the electric electrostatics. What is the corresponding law for the magnetostatics? The Biot-Savart's law. But so the fact that divergence of B is equal to 0 is contained in the Biot-Savart's law. That's a law. If tomorrow the magnetic poles existed, I will have an equation which is very similar to del dot E equal to rho by epsilon 0. It will not be of course that because of magnitude problems, dimension problems. But then Biot-Savart's law has to be changed. Remember, nobody derived by Savart's law for you. It was given to you, just as Newton's laws were given to you. Am I clear? Okay. So, now, if the field is expressible as a gradient of a scalar field, we have just now said its curl is zero. What is such a field is called? Ir irrotational field. Which field that you know, which is an, which is an irrotational field? Yes, somebody? Okay. Partially correct. He says electric field. Louder. Electrostatic field is the correct situation. Okay. Gravitational field is of course correct. Now, there is a fundamental theorem of vector calculus, which says, if you have any vector field, you can express it as a sum of two components. One component which will have divergence equal to 0, another part whose curl equal to 0. So this is true of any vector field. So we were just now talking about Coulomb's law. This is a law. What is found is this, that Coulomb's law basically stated what is the force between two charges? I will not go through it because we have done this several times, but and uh, the supplemented with our favorite Newton's third law. Whatever force one exerts on two, two exerts the same force on one. So you know that the force on particle charge number one due to two is there is a constant there which is one over four pi epsilon zero. Some books you will find that 1, pi, 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 is missing because this is all related to in which units you want to do your measurement. This is standard in all engineering institutions to do what is known as SI units. Which units physicists use? You know, we are very, very confused people. We will teach our electricity magnetism in SI units. Okay, maybe MKSA unit, but when you go to quantum mechanics, you don't like it. Have you seen a quantum mechanics book in SI units? No. In fact, the even the electricity magnetism books till about 10, 15 years back used to be in Gaussian units, MKSA units, and things like that. But today, I think all of us have learned that. Uh, Engineers prefer this unit, so therefore let's keep it SI units. Uh, even most of the uh, advanced books also, like even Jackson's book, which used to be till recently in uh, uh, MKSA unit, has changed over and now it is available in SI unit. So therefore, don't worry about this factor. This is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. It is permittivity of free space and things like that. All right. So let us summarize what we know about the electrostatic forces. So firstly, this is very interesting, it's an inverse square law. Inverse square law is a very interesting law. Gravitational field also is inverse square. In fact, 
The, you know, very interesting thing, I don't know how many of you have realized it. Say planets are bound to the earth by gravitational force. The electrons are bound to the nucleus by electrostatic force, which are both inverse square law. The inverse square law forces are central forces. What is a central force? Sorry? Directed from a fixed center or away from the fixed center. That's one part of its definition. Yes, that's one part of the definition. Something else is very important. No, 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 no. Let's not worry about centripetal, centrifugal. Both of them are central force. See, that talks about direction. That still talks about direction. There's something else there. See, you are all talking about radial. That is correct. It's a central force. But that simply talks about the direction, either outward or inward. But what else is important there? It is inversely proportional. No, it's not inversely proportional. Anybody? Who knows? No, that's the inverse square law force. What so is cent central centripetal force? acceleration will be there? No, no, no. We are talking about force. Super I am sure all of you know it, but you are not, you know, like happens to all our students. When a teacher asks a question, you sort of get confused. I am not trying to confuse you. You see, central force has two characters. First part is what he pointed out, and all of you agreed, that from the source of the force, it is either radially outward or radially inward. That is one part. But the magnitude of the force, not inverse square necessarily, depends only on the distance between the two. That is, the, it would be a central force if the force depends, the magnitude of the force is only dependent on distance. 1 over r square is a special case. In fact, it is known there are just two types of central forces which can give you a bound state. The first one obviously is the inverse square law, which we all know because after all we would not survive if the inverse square law did not bind. The planets are bound to the sun. What is the other force? Anybody remember? Just two forces. No other force will bind it. Closed orbits are possible only under two forces. No, no, no. You see, my question is different. Electrostatic or gravitational, they have the same feature. Both of them are central forces, both of them are inverse square law. And we know that both of them bind because atoms are bound, the planets are bound. Okay. I am saying there is another force, again central force, which also binds. Anybody has an idea? Magnetic. Sorry? Magnetic. Where is the magnetic force? Binding force. Binding force. What binding force? Okay. So let me, you know, I will be unnecessarily wasting time if I keep on asking. The only other force, central force, which is known to give closed orbits is Hooke's law force. You know what is the Hooke's law force? Okay. Three dimensional Hooke's law force. Spring force. Okay. That does not go as 1 over r square. It is proportional to r. Right. That force also binds it. Supposing you took a r cube or 1 over r cube, it will not bind. Inverse square law is important, Hooke's law is important. You know that is the reason why these two have been investigated by us like nothing else. So we said it is a central force. Actually speaking, when I asked you the question, the answer was already here. The magnitude depends only on the distance. And the direction is along the line joining the charges. Second thing is, it is a long range force. A long range force is one which really never becomes zero, no matter how far the distance is. 1 over r square force does not become zero. Which force becomes zero? Any force that you know in physics which becomes zero? Now listen to me. Yeah, I, Just because I am in an electricity magnetism course, always you do not have to think electricity magnetism. Yes, some people are talking about it here. Nuclear force. 
the, the short range nuclear force, the strong force, okay, that is very strong inside the nucleus and soon becomes zero. That's a short range force. So Coulomb force is a long range force. Okay? These are things which you of course know. Okay? Look at it. The other force that we know, there are four types of forces in nature. Just four forces which can explain everything. The weakest is the gravitational force. Typical strength, if you take strong nuclear force to be 1, is 10 to the power minus 38 or minus 39. It has an infinite range because gravitational force doesn't become 0. The next in line, weak, it's actually called weak nuclear force. This is a force which has a range of about 10 to the power minus 18 meters. Its strength is 10 to the power minus 6 compared to the strong force and that is responsible for things like beta decay. A force with which we are very much interested is the electromagnetic force, which typical strength is given here. Do you know what is this number called? Yeah? That number has a name. Very well known number in physics. Fine, fine structure constant. It's called the fine structure constant, right? Okay? And of course, strong nuclear force whose range is typically the size of the nucleus, which is about a Fermi. Now, you know, let me go to slightly not part of our course. You know, the modern theory of forces is this, that how do particles interact? You know, there's a problem there. We don't believe in action at a distance. What is meant by action at a distance? There are two particles here. They attract. How does this particle know that there is a particle there? No, but how does it know? How does the information come? Now, the question is this, that look, I know you are here because I am seeing you through a visible light. Correct? But, but what happens? That how does this mass suddenly know that there is a mass there? So the question is this, that there has to be a mediator. In, in the example that I gave you, the mediator was light. Okay? So basically, we were exchanging photons. Now, so what happens is this, that in the modern theory, we say that particles interact with each other by exchanging things. Exchanging things, I have said. It turns out these things which they exchange are bosons. Okay? As you know that all particles can be divided into two categories, all particles of the world, the fermions and the bosons. Okay? So the particles exchange bosons. And it is because they keep on exchanging, they're in some sense bound. It is imagined that what we are doing is the, you know, we are continuously, I am throwing you a ball, you are returning it back, I am throwing a ball, you are returning it back. Now it turns out. The carriers of long range forces are massless. The electromagnetic force carrier is what is called photon. And photon doesn't carry any charge. So in other words, the two charges are interacting because they are continuously exchanging photons. It's just, you know, occasionally when you teach, you sort of stop for a while and teach something which is not necessarily related to the, you know, the coursework or a problem that they will have. Another important point that you need to impress your students with is the superposition principle. The superposition principle is very interesting. It says, let us come back to the Coulomb field. We say, suppose that uh, the electric field at a point P is E. Okay? What does it mean? It means that if there is a charge Q, then it will experience a force QE. So if I have a charge Q1, this picture is not visible. If I have charge Q1 at R1, the field at R is given by this. This is Coulomb's law. Now mind you, superposition principle is not a trivial principle. 
because if superposition principle did not work, whole of electrodynamics has to change. Again, this is the way things have been found to be true. That is, if I have two sources of the electric field and I have a calculating the effect or the force experienced by a charged particle at a third point, the superposition principle tells me that you have to find out the force due to one as if the other one did not exist. Then consider the force due to the second one, imagining the first one did not exist and do a vector addition of that. Now mind you, things don't always add up. Effects don't necessarily have to add up. So the fact that they're adding up is helping us in simplifying problems. Addition of the field, so this is the field at P due to charges QI located at Ri is given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, sum over I QI R minus Ri by this Q. The, after you have gone through this, probably the next thing that you teach the students is the Gauss's law. One thing I want to tell you, Gauss's law and Coulomb's law are equivalent. There is no new physics in Gauss's law. Absolutely no new physics in Gauss's law. Then why do we use Gauss's law? Why not Coulomb's law? Any idea? If Gauss's law is absolutely equivalent to Coulomb's law, why have a separate law? Why give a name to Gauss? Any idea? Why do you teach Gauss's law? It's easy to calculate electric field for symmetrical structure. Absolutely. The point is that in situations where the problem shows a large degree of symmetry, see Coulomb's law is very difficult to work with. Superposition principle, you are, you have one or two is all right, have 10 charges, you will have a problem. Okay? Even good computers may not be able to help you. But if you, if your problem has sufficient symmetry, then you find Gauss's law provides a simplification. So, remember again, I talked about how surface integrals are calculated. Again, so the pictures is not, so there is a, uh, so what we are trying to say is that, remember I defined surface integral of a vector field. Electric field is a special vector field, nothing shows. So therefore I defined f dot ds, this is defined as e dot ds. So flux has the dimension of electric field times an area. That's the dimension of flux. Look at why Gauss's law works. Remember what was Gauss's law? It says that the flux out of a surface, okay, gives me the charge enclosed divided by some constant like permittivity of free space. So, what happens is this, that if you look at, I have sort of tried to tell you that there is a, a relationship with a solid angle. Remember how solid angle is defined. Recall also how an ordinary angle is defined. See, the way you define an ordinary angle is, I don't have a picture here, they have disabled that other one. That, okay, forget about that this is solid. Supposing I have one line and you have another line here. Then this angle that I have is basically that this length, length of the arc, divided by this length, radius. Right? R theta, that is the length of the arc. Also understand that an ordinary angle is dimensionless. Because you are dividing length of an arc by a distance. Both of them are in meter. So therefore, 
it is dimensionless but it is traditional to measure it in degrees or radians or things like that. So degree and radian are dimensionless quantities. Now suppose instead I have an area like this and I am looking at what is the angle that this makes at a point P. So what I do is this, from all parts of this area, I draw tangents to that point. So basically, I will have a cone-like thing generated there. Now, it is this cone, I define a solid angle as the perpendicular projection of this area divided by the square of this. Remember again, I had earlier arc length by distance, now I have a surface by distance square. Once again, the solid angle does not have a dimension. So this is, take the projection of this in the perpendicular direction so that you have a right cone and you get this as the solid angle. Why did I bring in solid angle? See, look at what is happening here. Supposing I have a volume here. And let us suppose there is a charge Q there. Now I am looking at the flux of the electric field through this surface. Now if the charge Q is inside, you notice that it subtends certain area there. And I can go on adding this up. And at every time, my direction of the normal to this surface is outward. So whether the surface is here or there, the lines if I join here, then the surface will be this. If I join there, the, the outward normal, always it is outward normal. But supposing the charge is, supposing the charge is outside the volume, then you notice that if you draw these lines, then it cuts the solid at two places, here and there. The solid angle subtended by both are the same, though the magnitude of the surface areas will be different. But more important than that, the direction of the normal on this sector is outward, here, and this is there. So therefore, what happens is, if I am looking at how much is the flux, the flux can be written as that it is q d omega by 4 pi epsilon 0. So, because of this reason, that if you add up these angles, then in one case, the when the charge was outside, the things cancel out because each point subtends two area on the surface and they will cancel out. So, therefore, we say the flux is Q enclosed divided by epsilon. Whatever charge is inside, the outside one does not matter. So I have got this. The flux definition is E dot ds. That is equal to, according to divergence theorem, it is the same as divergence of E dv, which is equal to charge enclosed. Charge enclosed is density multiplied by dv by 1 over epsilon 0. Now you compare these two expressions. Both of them are volume integral. Okay, and valid for arbitrary volumes. So therefore, I get del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon 0. That is the first Maxwell's equation that we have derived in differential form. Okay. So you notice now, let us come back to what happened to divergence of B. Because I could not close, I could not get rid of a north pole if I have a south pole. I could not get rid of a south pole if I have a north pole. So if here, I had to worry about a positive charge the moment I have a negative charge. Then also I will always get this to be equal to 0 because Q enclosed will always be 0 in that case. But fortunately, we have charges there. Okay? So therefore, del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon 0 is our first Maxwell's equations for electrostatics. Okay. All right. Now you will find sometimes I will um, write down big expressions, but don't worry about it. I am not going to be deriving it here. 
it might be found for your uh, in the Moodle in case you are interested. But for example, I made a statement that um, Gauss's law can be derived from uh, Coulomb's law. Remember, Gauss's law is del dot of E. Okay, so del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon zero. Now, electric field you write down in the form of Coulomb's law. Now, if you do that, then I can uh, do a little bit of an algebra, which I am not going to do. Okay, but I will put it in my Moodles, and there is a pi missing there, which is because of some reason I don't know why. That square there is a pi. Okay, and you can show that from Coulomb's law I can get the differential form of Gauss's law. They are absolutely equivalent. Okay, let us look at a very standard problem. The standard problem is this. Supposing there is a charge which is at the center, which is at the center of a cube of dimension a by a by a. How much is the flux through each surface? One sixth, absolutely correct, because they must be the same. The problem is not that. The problem is put that charge at one of the corners. The symmetry is not there. It's in one corner. Now, QY twenty four is written here, but you have to explain why he is saying one by eight. Sorry. So basically, the concept of symmetry it's not necessary. Concept of symmetry doesn't have to be real. It could be an imagined symmetry also. Okay, these are called Gaussian surfaces. So what you do is that this is what you have here. Now I know how to solve the problem of if the charge was at the center. You all immediately said one six. Can I put that charge at the center? I can do that if I stack it up with more cubes. Supposing I stacked it up with more cubes so that it becomes like this, and my charge becomes at the center. Now what has happened is that if I had a bigger cube, side two a by two a, and this point was at the center, you would agree that it is one sixth, right? Q by epsilon zero, Q by six epsilon zero. But then the, this side. Is one fourth of the side of this. This this size is one fourth of this size. So from q by six, I get another one fourth. So what is important is you also realize how the symmetry can be used for your benefit. Okay, uh, I will begin my next session with an example from here. Standard problems which you people do, as I have announced earlier, when you go back, because here I have very little time to do problems. Now suppose you feel that some problems, which you would like the students to understand better, and you would like us to put it uh, at that time, you can send it send send it to us by email. The the emails will be provided. Point out that look, it will be nice if this thing is done, and we will try to collect all the such requests and try to see what is the best we can do. Any question? Any doubts? Yeah. Actually, sir, when we teach the students, yeah, they are just for the senior secondary examinations. Right. And whenever we ask them about uh, flux of a vector field, right. they just answer that uh, these are the lines of force that pass through a surface normally. Absolutely. So but, uh, the, the, the point is this, you are, you are absolutely right, uh, they, that's what they do because that's the way they have been taught. Yeah, but so, my question is that yeah. uh, without doing the mathematics, how can we make them the concept of uh, yes. uh, flux clear? So you, you could do that, that's the reason I brought in the question of uh, a well, uh, liquid flow, okay? So the thing is, it's very easy for you to talk to them, supposing I have a pipe which is going through. Yeah, they have seen it, right? Now you put a, the, the, along the line, you put a surface. How much, you know, I mean, uh, uh, let us suppose that surface is uh, like a sieve, so that the water can flow through. Now you ask them that, look, you see that if I keep it perpendicular, the amount of water that flows in, 
And then you ask them, supposing you tilt it, what happens? Is this clear? Now, this is an experiment which the students would be able to think of in mentally also. All right? So, see the lines of forces came in because of that. That is because, now there is nothing like, you know, what are these lines of forces and all that? There is nothing wrong with it. They are representations. But when your students are going to first year after having done the school, you have to also do a little bit of unlearning for them. Right? Now, this is the problem all of us have. Now, maybe we get much better students here, but nevertheless, they have also been spoilt by the coaching classes. They tell them, look, don't bother about understanding. How fast you can crack the examination is the most important one. <laughs> so, so don't think that what we have, maybe they are on an average better student, but in terms of their training, they are exactly the same. Okay? What they will do is, they will not talk in terms of lines of forces, but they will say, well, memorize. It is integral phi dot ds. So, making student unlearn something is one of the professional hazards all of us have. Try to see, wherever possible, whether you can ask them that, can you think of such a thing? You see, flux is very easily explained with water jets. Just get a pipe in the class if you like. I mean, I know that's not possible. But if they go to a lab, you can do that. Right? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll see you again in the second half of the today.